Welcome to Upside Down Mirror, one woman's true story of a twin flame journey, a reflection of true love, true hate, and everything between, where everything and nothing matters at the same time. shatter as mirrors of shadows cut through indestructible layers testing the sands of time hello everyone and welcome to episode 11 of upside down mirror so it had already been over six weeks since i had been in prison and it seemed like forever i was talking to my youngest sister every day because she was actually taking the initiative to reach out to my caseworker at the prison to get my parole hearing organized. It was a law that after one quarter of your time, everybody has a chance to be released on parole. That would be three months for me. But the key was, is three months is not a long time in the prison world. Everything goes so slowly. So it would be almost miraculous to get a parole hearing scheduled that soon after getting in prison to be released after three months. My sister used to work with me in my practice and we were very familiar with Maryland agencies and paperwork. So we definitely knew how to be on top of things and she was the one that I would have do that in my practice. So she would call my caseworker at the prison and ask the caseworker where my paperwork was and the caseworker would say to her, I just sent over documentation to this agency and they need to fill this out. Then my sister would get on the phone with that agency and prompt them to find the paperwork and to get that going. And then when they would send it back to the caseworker at the prison, then she would do the same. So she was following the paperwork trails and putting them together for me to try to expedite the process because once again, the key was to get the parole hearing scheduled as soon as possible so that I could be released as soon as possible. I spent a lot of time thinking about that and organizing that and I was forever grateful to her for doing that for me. Meanwhile, I'm just dealing with life on a daily basis, thinking about things, worrying about things, and doing things that I never thought I would do or be worried about. I missed life outside of prison and just really spent a lot of time in a space of faith and hope and conscious creation. The woman who had been hitting on me, who calls herself Jerry, it was a game of cat and mouse. She would try to sit with me at lunch and talk to me in the common areas. Luckily, I was able to avoid her as much as possible for the most part with the help of other people. There were some uncomfortable situations that I was put in with her saying things and insinuating things, but for the most part, I felt like I was being divinely protected there as well. I was just buying time until I got out of there so nothing major would happen with her. The people that I ended up hanging around were the people that were only there for about the same time as me who had done things like violation of probation, minor drug crimes, and believe it or not, one girl was actually put in there for writing too many bounced checks because remember, there was no print, there was no jails for women. So that's where I was supposed to be was in a jail. So whoever's supposed to go in a jail, they had to go to a maximum security prison because the only thing they had. So she was actually there for writing bad checks. I bet you she will never write a bad check again after that experience. The girls' names that I hung around were Jennifer and Rabbit and Rock. I don't even know Rabbit and Rock's real names as people went by nicknames in there and of course Danielle. 
we sat together at every meal and hung out together when there was common time during the day and night. We held each other's places in the phone lines. We hooked each other up with commissary and played the famous card games such as spades or even charades in prison. Daniel told, Danielle told me that from the beginning that the best thing to do to make the time pass was to work in the kitchen. She said that the year that she was there, she spent most of her time from morning until night in the kitchen working. And she said, as, as soon as you got there, it felt like you just left and then you would be so tired, you would go back and sleep. And she said time went by very, very fast and she actually liked it. Many people dreaded that knock in the morning when they were told that they had to work in the kitchen, which seemed to be quite a lot. There was a lot of people that they called for kitchen duty and a lot of people hid or tried to avoid it, but Danielle actually wanted to be put in the kitchen. And I actually felt sort of excited to be with that potential too, because I wanted time to go fast. The other people who didn't work went to school to finish their education. Of course, I'd already had a graduate degree, so that was not an option for me. So I went on a journey to find a job, but believe it or not, no one wanted me. Everyone around me was hiding from jobs. They didn't want a job. The kitchen staff would come and find them and make them work, and they would pretend they were sick, and the kitchen staff wouldn't believe them and make them come anyway. But me, I actually wanted to work, and I was unable to. I remember walking in the kitchen during lunch, just walking through the door, because Danielle said she knew the people there and she said hi and she introduced me she's like she wants to work in the kitchen she wants a job the guard looked at me and yelled at me and said get out if we want you we'll come and get you they did not want me so I just took a deep breath tapped in and my guardian parents and spirit guide said this is not your time to distract yourself because that's what I had done in my other life outside of prison during my marriage um, I worked constantly. It was my distraction to to escape. And so my guides were saying, no, this is not your time to escape, Rebecca. This is your time to deal with your inner self, deal with your inner child, get to know who you really are. So that was also divinely paranormal that you're unable to get a job where you're only making a dollar a day, by the way, in prison. So Everybody was like, how is it that you're not getting a job and everybody else around you has to work? And I just said, I really don't know. I slept about 12 hours of the day. I tried to go to bed around 10 or 11, 9, 10 or 11, and actually sleep for 12 hours. That was my goal. I read practically every library book in the library, specifically the paranormal ones and the ones on spirituality. I exercised for about an hour and a half to two hours a day. And then the rest of the time I just spent um, with the girls that I met there or in meditation, just trying to get by. A major reprieve for me was the ability to walk outside. When I was held for the first six weeks, when I wasn't in general population, we weren't able to go outside because they didn't know us well enough. So when you're in general population, they get to know you and they decide whether or not you can walk outside. There are a lot of people who walk outside between lunch and dinner as a recreation. It's also a, a thing there where there are certain women that were ostracized because of the crimes they committed and walking up to them and even talking to them out of compassion would have not been in your best interest as far as getting attacked by another person. One woman that had been ostracized was a woman who had had foster children and she wanted to keep the money for having foster children but she didn't want to take care of them. So she killed the foster children, put them in a freezer and eventually in order to get rid of them ended up chopping them up and feeding them in food to her husband and this happened quite a while before she was caught and how I found this out was is that I had to sit at a different table at lunch and there was women there that had been there longer that were praying and blessing their food which I thought was actually 
a really cool thing until they looked at me and they're like, you definitely have to do this because the person that is making our food is the person that killed the foster kids and fed them to her husband. Another woman had been a prostitute and apparently addicted to meth and crack at the same time. She had a three month old baby who she was prostituting and had a client who was complaining about the baby crying in the crib and she took the baby, put the baby in a pillowcase and banged it against the wall until it died. The stories that I heard were just indescribable. There were many, many stories like this and I'm not gonna spend my time telling you guys all of the gruesome details. There were a lot of gang members in prison who had to initiate, who got initiated by killing people. When you hear the stories, drugs are often associated with the actual crimes. I heard a lot of stories around meth, meth, crack, and heroin. I believe that these are drugs that are portals to very low frequency behaviors and very dark behaviors. I remember thinking when I was in there that if there was no such thing as drugs, practically the whole prison would be empty. And I'm not just saying that. However, prison is not a place to go for a drug addict who, who has not committed an aggressive crime. There is no help for people on an emotional or mental level with their addictions to drugs or anything else. The system is very antiquated. If you said that you felt suicidal, you were put in an outfit that was sleeveless that looked like, like a burlap bag and then your hands were handcuffed behind your back and you're put in a room that they kept cold for about 48 hours as you're just sitting there in this bag and you're being observed by the guards. It was very hard to get a counseling appointment as well, so it's like you were being tortured out of being suicidal. It was very easy to get psychiatric medication in there compared to the counseling. I remember thinking that the system was very poor and that no one was really getting help or they were not getting rehabilitation while being in there. When I look back on it now, I definitely see the reason that the guardian parents took away my psychic abilities was because I was able to connect with the girls that I hung out with on a level that I haven't connected with people on probably since childhood. It was just me and me. What you have inside of the prison cannot be external. No matter how much money you have, no matter what abilities you think you have, it's just going to be you and your personality that get you through that experience. I remember hearing stories of people that were in there for a lifetime. One woman took the rap for her son because he murdered someone, so she accepted a lifetime in prison. There was a 23-year-old girl in there that had killed her boyfriend because he broke up with her. Oddly enough, she seemed so sweet and unable to snap like that but she was facing the rest of her life in prison because of this. I made it a point to talk to some of the people that I felt safe with who were facing a life in prison, whose stories were so unbearable that I couldn't even imagine how they were living every day. All of the answers that I got of how they dealt with it were the same. They all said to me, you learn to take one moment at a time. You learn that you can't control the past and you learn that you can't control the future. The only thing that you can do is just survive that one moment. You live in that second, and when you accept being able to live in that second, you can start to live in the next second, and then the next second. And then your mind, body, and spirit just adjust accordingly, and you begin not to worry. This is surrendering, and definitely the way to get into the flow of your heart space. Even though I still was unable to imagine being able to do that at that time, I saw these people and they actually looked happy at times. They were laughing and dancing and talking to one another and decorating their cells as though they were preparing to live the rest of their life in harmony there. And it made me realize that the ability to live in the moment is everything. It's the way to get us through times of the ultimate trauma and suffering, times that we think we're unable to get through, 
this is how we get through them. So once again, I encourage myself and everybody else to practice doing this so that we don't have to come up to situations like this where we're forced to do it. So as you live your every day and you start to worry, you start to get into anxiety, really get perspective. Just take a deep breath, surrender into the moment and know, hey, I'm okay. I'm perfectly fine right now in the moment. And just accept that and surrender into that and then build that to the next moment and then the next moment. And before you know it, you're going to start to reside in a frequency of joy and then you're, start, you're going to start to manifest accordingly. There were guards everywhere in prison. When you went outside, as you went from point A to point B through any meals, no matter where you're at, there's always guards looking at you. And the guards have no idea why you're there and they don't really care. So you get treated the same no matter what. You could be someone who killed a child or you could be someone who wrote a bad check. You're going to get treated the same by these guards. And I found that to be really hard to deal with, with the lack of respect that you received as a person even being there. I remember one day we were in the cafeteria and there was a guard who you can tell by looking at him that he was quite egotistical. And there was a woman, an older woman, sitting at a table and it was her table's turn to leave, but she couldn't get up. I don't think she was able, I think she was having some leg or hip difficulties and she wasn't able to push herself up. And the guard just got up and started yelling in her face and then actually took her arm and started to pull her up. And one of the other women there who was known to be kind of a badass tore the guard apart, like started yelling at him, calling him a pussy, calling him weak. And then she started saying things that really would trigger a lot of men. And she turned around, she glared at him, she turned around and started to walk away. You could see that he just snapped and he just took off, ran after her and started strangling her from behind. I think he would have killed her. He wanted her to die. I mean, he had her around the neck. Her face was turning red. All of the other guards came up and pulled him off. He really lost control. That was extremely um, wild for me to see at that time. And then later I heard, and later I mean later that day, I heard that he got put on administrative leave, which I thought was good, right? And I asked a couple days later, because I didn't see him around anywhere. I was like, oh, so he must have got fired. And then they said, no, they took him away from everybody and put him up in the towers. And the guards in the towers were the ones that you like see on the movies with the guns. And so they're armed. And what they do is they look to make sure no one's trying to escape because if you're trying to escape, they can actually shoot you. And I remember thinking that is the worst place to put that man is with an armed gun on a tower where he can shoot everybody. And I just remember feeling really on edge at that level of decision-making within the prison. Once again, when you're in that situation, you begin to appreciate the things in life that you took for granted before, such as the fact that I was very, very fortunate because I had a very loving family. I had four sisters and my mom, my children, and Sean, who would come down to visit me. Some people, they didn't have any support, not even phone support. When they were talking on the phone, they were I heard them being put down by the people they were talking to. They didn't have any visitors. We were allowed to have visitors two times a week. And even though it took my family three hours to drive there, and it took Sean an hour and a half flight and then another 40-minute drive, both my mom and my sisters, even my best friend and Sean came to visit me with my youngest child at the time. I remember being so thankful for that. They painted the visiting room to make it look like we were in the most cheerful place ever. And I remember looking around thinking that that was definitely false advertisement. We had to be searched before we went into the waiting room and after we got out of the waiting room because drugs were so prevalent in the prison that they were scared that the drugs were getting in through the waiting room. Although rumor had it that they were getting in mostly through the guards and some of the guards were actually actually got in trouble for that. But because of this, it was extremely difficult for me to hold my baby at the time. My youngest was just a little baby and I missed her so much. And when Sean would bring her 
I remember just holding her and the way that she would be still and the way that she would hug me, it just put me at ease very fast. I remember thinking she was extremely special, that she knew on a level what was going on. And, you know, that was such a loving act, the, the energy exchange that she would give me during that time. Sean would tell me during these visits that he just wanted me to come and live with him afterwards, that I didn't have to worry about money, that I could live in his home, that he would take care of me and I could get back on my feet as I needed to. And he didn't know that I had money saved through work and investments. So I thought that that was extremely sweet that he was willing to take care of me because that was one of the things I questioned about our relationship was, is he with me because he thinks I make a lot of money? Does he see this the style of life that's he, that he wants to be a part of? And so, you know, he had no clue what was going to happen after I left and he was willing to completely support me. And so that really shifted my feelings for him. And my, my son, it was his... 16th birthday when I was sentenced and the next three weeks after that after his birthday he lost his childhood home he lost his dog who he loved dearly his little sister who he enjoyed and had to go live with his dad full time and I was very concerned that he would just be full of anger and resentment and he came to visit me and he looked at me and said mom this has given me the ability to step back and to see what I had in my life. Like all of the Christmases that you did, Sandy the Elf, the way that you organized Santa coming, the Easters, waking up in the morning and having breakfast, all the things in my childhood that I took for granted. Now I realize that not every kid has. He's like, it just makes me feel so grateful. And I can't even begin to tell you in words how blessed I felt that my son said that to me because there are so many different ways that he could have taken this. He could have been full, once again, of anger and resentment. So it's always really good to have gratitude no matter where you're at. And I remember feeling so extremely grateful. My family, when they came to see me, would actually comment about how rested I looked. And mind you, I every day I woke up wishing that I could get out. I missed my life so bad, my family so bad. But it's the ability, once again, just to kind of surrender into that moment and take care of yourself the best you can while in whatever situation you're in. You know, the ability to get 12 hours of sleep every day, an hour and a half of exercise every day, and the leisure reading that I was doing. Of course, you know, you think of someone in prison, you think they should look stressed. But once again, it's about what you're doing for yourself. It's not about where you're at, it's about how you're treating yourself in the self-love. The power of surrendering and accepting your fate can lead you once again into that zero point energy. One day, Danielle and I were outside walking because it was a beautiful fall day and my favorite season is fall. And it was such a relief to be outside walking and, and to breathe that fresh air because once again, the section we were in was like literal hell. The energy was still and stagnant and it felt so freeing to be outside. But when we walked around outside, we were surrounded by these old abandoned buildings. That prison had been there since the early 1900s and those buildings had once been used for different things. And I was looking in the building, one of the buildings, and I saw a woman with long blonde hair that had a white robe on with long sleeves and she had her hands tied in the front. It wasn't handcuffs, they were tied and she had her head down. And at first I thought that she was a real person then I realized, because I hadn't seen dead people in a while and then I didn't really have that many psychic abilities so I thought that she was real and then I realized she was a ghost and all of a sudden I heard that her name was Rose. And so I knew that she had to be crossed over. I didn't do it right then, but I knew she had to be crossed over. I didn't say anything to the girls around me because I'm used to keeping it to myself because normally people can't see what I see. And if I tell them what's going on, they normally don't believe me. Well, that night 
when Danielle and I were going to bed, I decided to go ahead and spend that time crossing Rose over. And just as I had called Rose into my awareness and consciousness and I was connecting her to the light, I felt extreme resistance. Rose did not want to go. But then Danielle said, Rebecca, what are you doing and who do you have in here? And I said, you can see her? I was so surprised because I've had no one be able to see these things that are around me like I can. And she said, yeah. And she described her perfectly. She said she had a long, a long white robe on, long blonde hair, and her hands were tied in the front. And she said, Rebecca, I have chills. She said, this doesn't feel right. This woman doesn't want to be crossed over. She's very angry. Just then a guard walked up and Danielle looked at the guard because this is just the way Danielle is. And Danielle said, I forget the guard's name, but she said to the guard who was a female, we have a ghost in here. We have a ghost in here. And you could tell that the guard didn't believe her at first, but then the whole door, it, it was an electric door. It started making sounds and started shaking. That was very paranormal. The guard looked scared, didn't say anything, and just walked away. Well, Danielle and I spent that night crossing Rose over, so I thought. Later, I'd find out something different. And then in the morning, you know, I walked out to go to breakfast. And so I'm used to this being in my everyday life, so I didn't really think about it too much. But I saw the guard there, and the guard said, is everything okay? And I didn't remember what she was talking about. I was like, yeah, everything's okay. And she said, no, she goes, I'm referring to the ghost. Did you get rid of the ghost? She was serious. She was actually kind of scared. And I said, oh yeah, we took care of that. I knew then how gifted and open, clairvoyant and intuitive Danielle was. I mean, she knew we were going to be placed together. I believe that I was detained for that few weeks um, at the other place so that I would be with her and so I decided to spend some time teaching Danielle energy work and how to read people and all of the techniques that I knew before I'd even gotten in there I knew that Danielle would be so good at it and that I knew she would really enjoy it once again she had the veils open between the two worlds because of her overdose a lot of people with near-death experiences have an opening afterwards. Danielle had an infectious personality. She had the type of personality where when she walked into a room, the whole room would light up. People, she made people laugh. People just gravitated towards her. And of course, when I met Danielle, you know, she wasn't on heroin. And I understand there are two different people. There's the one on heroin and the one, the one that's not on heroin. So I knew the frustration that her family had with her but i also could see her gifts and i noticed you know with a lot of drug addicts they have these gifts they're very empathic they're very intuitive they have this yearning for passion and joy to the point where sometimes they turn to the drugs as an escape because they think that they're going to get that feeling that false god energy so when I was working with Danielle and I was teaching her how to do these techniques and I was holding her hand, my guardian parents gave me the ability to read her, which remember they took that away when I got into prison. And I think they did this for a reason because I distinctively saw two roads in front of Danielle. One was to the right, it was dark and black, and one was to the left and I could see her laughing and playing and being with her children and having actually like a really good career and a really good life. Danielle was only about 35, so she had her whole life ahead of her. And I, so I said to her, she asked me, you know, what are you reading about me? And I was like, I'm gonna tell you the truth. If you go back to drugs, and I knew this to be true, if you go back to drugs, you will die and you are going to die fast. So it is very important that you do what you have to do now to get yourself straight and away from the drugs. And Danielle had said to me, she said, it's about the environment you know when she leaves there she can't go back to Baltimore she can't go back to the same people she said that's so important she told me that being around me and just being in the environment of even prison it was easy to stay off drugs she said that when she left and if she would go back to the same people she's like she knew she wouldn't be able to do it so she explained that her mom 
you know, who was once a very loving mom and it got remarried, had tried to help her, but her mom was extremely frustrated, which I understand. So I asked her if she wanted me to talk to her mom and she said, yes. Yeah. So I spent quite a few phone calls on the phone with her mom, talking to her and telling her mom, you know, I'm helping Danielle through this, my past experience with, with working with people and counseling people. And her mom was on board. Her mom was actually making phone calls to get her set up with halfway houses, you know, rehabilitation houses in Hagerstown, which was quite a far away from Baltimore, you know, to get Danielle in a place that was transitional. She wasn't ready to accept Danielle into her home, but she was willing to put the financial um, commitment out and the emotional and, and supportive commitment out to help Danielle through this. I told her mom how grateful I was that Danielle was able to make me feel moments of joy and laughter in, in a place like this. There was one time where Danielle and I were bored and she's like, let's fill out a grievance. And Danielle had this way about her where she did not have difficulty expressing herself and being authentic. She would say things that were on her mind. She didn't really have a filter. and she definitely had an attraction toward the the male guards in that place and she let them knew it they would it, it was quite actually embarrassing they would come to look th through the window at us to make sure like you know everything was okay and she would bend over and stick her butt out and start shaking it and everybody had already known her because she was there before so they would just laugh at her and walk away you know and she she kind of made it innocent but there was one guard where they nicknamed him boomy so that's how i know him even to this day is boomy um where she had a major attraction towards and so in this grievance she would she was writing a grievance about him for being too sexy so the whole grievance was like a joke just to make us laugh and she was writing all the things down all the complaints that she had about him but you know it got kind of perverted but it actually you know made me laugh and um it was something to end the night on a on a positive note well that next day we were um when we were going to lunch she took the grievance for some reason and she's like she just put it on my desk and i remember thinking we got, we got to get rid of that because that would not be um accepted if someone would see that like a guard so i went with her to to lunch and then she had to do something so we parted ways and i came back and boomy stopped me at the desk and he said um you know you're cell has been chosen to be searched a random search for drugs which was normal people were randomly searched for drugs because drugs were so prevalent there i felt the blood drain from my face there is no way i looked innocent because i could feel my expression changing i could feel the loss of my own breath because i remember thinking about that grievance on top of my desk and there was a hundred percent chance that if he saw a grievance about him that he was going to read it. It's just the way it was there. And so he looked at me and he saw my face and he said, you have drugs in there, don't you? And he said, you look really guilty. And I said, no, it's not drugs. And he said, do you have something to tell me? And I, I was speechless. I literally could not form words. And so I took a deep breath once again. And the way this feels is there's a whole bunch of heat when you're in this type of moment. It's, it just feels like a whole bunch of heat, like the Kundalini's rising. And then you feel yourself drop into the center of your heart. And you feel yourself just, it, it's not even, it's, I can say it feels like you give up, but it's more like a letting go. So it's kind of like giving up and letting go at the same time where you're just like, whatever. And you just let go. That is surrendering into the field of the heart. And he looked at me right after I did that. And he said, you know what? you're lucky that Danielle's a roommate because I'm just going to sign off on this like I'd searched your cell. He signs off on it and then lets me go. And once again, why am I telling you this? Because these are the moments that I have used what I teach in surrendering to the field of the heart and to zero point to change my outside reality and it happens instantaneously. So I'm going to stop episode 11 here and I hope to see you in episode 12.